If uh, some of you are looking for a church home, we'd encourage you to check us out and consider maybe making this your home. If you have a church home, thank you for visiting and worshiping us today. One thing you need to know about Aletheia is that we love the Word of God, and so I want to invite you right now to take your copy of God's Word and turn with me, if you will, to Genesis chapter 24, which is where we're going to be. We have been working through the book of Genesis here at Aletheia, and today, just so happened on Baptism Sunday, our text is a very long text. Uh, so we're not going to cover every nook and cranny of this wonderful story today, and, though, and yet I am really committed to reading all of the texts that we're going to go through, and so I want to encourage you to just read along with me, Genesis 24, 67 verses. We're going to read them all. All right, y'all ready? All right, let's do this. Here we go. Now Abraham was old, well advanced in years, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge of all that he had, put your hand under my thigh that I may make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughter of the Canaanites among whom I dwell, but will go to my country and to my kindred and take a wife for my son Isaac. The servant said to him, perhaps the woman may not be willing to follow me to this land. Must I then take your son back to the land from which you came? Abraham said to him, See to it that you do not take my son back there. Uh, the Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and who spoke to me and swore to me, to your offspring I will give this land, he will send his angel before you, and you shall take a wife for my son from there. But if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be free from this oath of mine. Only you must not take my son back there. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. And then the servant took ten of his master's camels and departed, taking all sorts of choice gifts from his master. And he rose and went to Mesopotamia, to the city of Nahor. And he made the camels kneel down outside the city by the well of water at the time of evening, the time when women go out to draw water. And he said, O Lord, God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today. And show steadfast love to my master Abraham. Behold, I am standing by the spring of water, and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Let the young woman to whom I shall say, Please let down your jar uh, that I may drink, who shall say, Drink, and I will water your camels. Let her be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. By this I shall know that you have shown steadfast love to my master." Before he had finished speaking, behold, Rebekah, who was born to Bethuel, the son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, came out with her water jar on her shoulder. The young woman was very attractive in appearance, a maiden whom no man had known. She went down to the spring and filled her jar and came up. A servant ran to meet her and said, please give me a little water to drink from your jar. She said, drink, my lord. And she quickly let down her jar upon her hand and gave him a drink. When she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw water for your camels also until they have finished drinking. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough and ran again to the well to draw water. And she drew for all his camels. The man gazed at her in silence to learn whether the Lord had prospered his journey or not. When the camels had finished drinking, the man took a gold ring weighing a half shekel and two bracelets for her arms weighing ten gold shekels and said, please tell me whose daughter you are. Is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? She said to him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, whom she bore to Nahor. She added, we've got plenty of both straw and fodder and room to spend the night. The man bowed his head and worshiped the Lord and said, blessed be the Lord, the God of my master, Abraham, who has not forsaken his steadfast love and his faithfulness towards my master. As for me, the Lord has led me in the way to the house of my father's kinsman. And the young woman ran and told her mother's household about these things. Rebecca had a brother whose name was Laban. Laban ran out towards the man to the spring, and as soon as he saw the ring and the bracelets on his sister's arms and heard the words of Rebecca, his sister, thus the man spoke to me. He went to the man, and behold, he was standing by the camels at the spring. He said, come in, O blessed of the Lord. Why do you stand outside? I have prepared the house and a place for the camels. So the man came to the house and unharnessed the camels and gave straw and fodder to the camels. And there was water to wash his feet and the feet of the men who were with him. And then the food was set before him to eat. 
And he said, I will not eat until I've said what I have to say. And he said, speak on. He said, I'm <clears throat> Abraham's servant. The Lord has greatly blessed his master, and he has become great. He's given him flocks and herds, silver and gold, male servants and female servants, camels and donkeys. And Sarah, his, my master's wife, bore a son to my master when she was old. And to him, he has given all that he has. My master made me swear, saying, you shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites in whose land I dwell, but you shall go to my father's house and to my clan and take a wife for my son. I said to my master, perhaps the woman will not follow me. But he said to me, the Lord before whom I, walk, I have walked will send his angel with you and prosper your way. You shall take a wife for my son for my, from my clan and from my father's house. Then you will be free from my oath. Uh, when you come to my clan, and if they will not give her to you, then you will be free from my oath. I came today to the spring and said, O Lord, the God of my master Abraham, if now you are prospering the way that I go, behold, I am standing by the spring of water. Let the virgin who comes out to draw water to whom I shall say, please give me a little water from your jar to drink, and who will also say to me, drink, and I will draw water for your camels also, let her be the woman whom the Lord has appointed for my master's son. And before I had finished speaking in my heart, behold, Rebekah came out with her water jar on her shoulder. And she went down to the spring and drew water. And I said to her, please let me drink. She quickly let down her jar from her shoulder and said, drink, and I will give your camels drink also. So I drank, and she gave the camels drink also. Then I asked her, whose daughter are you? And she said, the daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, from Milka, who Milka bore to him. So I put the ring on her nose and the bracelets on her arms, and I bowed my head and worshiped the Lord and blessed the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who had led me by the right way to take the daughter of my master's kinsman for his son. Now, if then you are going to show steadfast love and faithfulness to my master, tell me. And if not, tell me, that I may turn to the right hand or to the left. Then Laban and Bethuel answered and said, the thing has come from the Lord. We cannot speak to you bad or good. Behold, Rebekah is before you. Take her and go. And let her be the wife of your master's son as the Lord had spoken. When Abraham's servant heard the word, these, their words, he bowed himself to the earth before the Lord. And the servant brought out jewelry and silver and gold and garments and gave them to Rebekah. He also gave to her brother and to her mother costly ornaments. And he ran and the men, excuse me, and he and the men who were with him ate and drank, and they spent the night there. When they arose in the morning, he said, send me away to my master. Her brother and her mother said, oh, let the young woman remain with us a little while, at least ten days. After that, she may go. But he said to them, do not delay me, since the Lord has prospered my way. Send me away, that I may go to my master. They said, let us call the young woman and ask her. And they called Rebekah and said, will you go with this man? She said, I will go. So they sent away Rebekah, their sister, her, and her nurse, and Abraham's servant and his men. And they blessed Rebekah and said to her, Our sister, may you become thousands of ten thousands, and may your offspring possess the gate of him who hate, uh, of those who hate him. And then Rebekah and her young women arose and rode on the camels and followed the man. Thus the servant took Rebekah and went his way. Now Isaac had returned from Beer, Beer Lahai Roy, and was dwelling in the Negev. And Isaac went out in, to meditate in the field toward the evening. And he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, there were camels coming. And Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from the camel and said to her servant, who, or to the servant, Who is this man walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, It is my master. So she took her veil and covered herself. The servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Then Isaac brought her into the tent of Sarah, his mother, and took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Whew. All right, amen. Let's pray. God, thank you for uh, the word of God. It is honey on our lips, God. It is food for our soul, and I pray that you will feed us, God, today. May we listen and not simply be hearers of the word, but more so be doers of the word. Lord, please don't let me get in the way. I pray this in your name. Amen. 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 Well, in 1997, I met my wife, Denise, at Western Carolina University. Um, it wasn't 
the most epic meeting ever. We were both uh, athletes at the school, and we were waiting for our sports physical really early in the morning, and I woke her up because she was taking a little nap there in the doctor's office, and I learned right away that the niece is grumpy in the mornings, and I've learned that fact 23 years still today. I'm reminded of that every day. Um, That could have been the end before it began, but uh, it wasn't. Our initial relationship wasn't romantic, though. We just became really good friends, and and uh, in fact, I was so clueless as to what the Lord might be doing in my life that I came up with a plan to set Denise up with my best friend who just happened to live in my hometown. Now, we lived about two hours away from the school that we went to. And so I would take Denise on the weekends that we didn't have competitions down to date my best friend. Uh, now, by God's providence, this is all happening, right? And by God's providence, I had an old pickup truck that was a piece of junk, and the radio didn't work, all right? And so two hours down the mountain, we would just talk. And then I'd drop her off for my friend. And then two hours up the mountain, we would just talk and talk and talk. And those of you who know us well know I did a lot of listening, all right? <laughs> and by God's grace, God was using my kind of maybe ill-advised plan here to form our hearts together, to knit our hearts together. And now she is my bride, and we've been married for 23 years. Now, the point of this story is not to give you guys dating advice, okay? I hope you guys aren't out there going, that girl over is kind of cute. Maybe I should try to set her up with my best friend, you know? (laughs) It worked for Pastor Rob, you know? Uh, No, don't do that. The point is to to just tell a story from my own life about the providence of God, right? I mean, I wasn't, this wasn't a very good plan, and yet the Lord was at work every step of the way in my own marriage. And that is really the way we as Christians ought to look at all of life, right? Proverbs 16, 9 tells us this truth, that the heart of man plans his ways, but the Lord directs his steps or establishes his steps, And I do wonder, church, if we actually believe in the providence of God. Well, our story today is all about that providence, and it's going to drive this point home, I think, with glorious beauty. Abraham, the sort of main character that we've been looking at over the last many weeks here, has learned a lot of lessons along the way. And one of the most vivid lessons that he's learned is this one. God is the God who provides. He learned it in glorious fashion in chapter 22, up on top of Mount Moriah, the place where his, his faith was tested when God said, sacrifice your son, your only son. And of course, the Lord intervened on that mountain and provided a substitute to die in the place of his son, a ram caught in the thicket. And the mountain was appropriately called, the Lord will provide. He had provided for Abraham every step of the way, including, by the way, Not in the least the moments when Abraham had made bad decisions and when Sarah had made bad decisions, compromising the word of the Lord. The providence of God was never thwarted even by their uh, unwise decisions. Well, now here we are. We find Abraham, and he is very, very old at this point in the story. And he's exhibiting a battle-tested faith in the providence of the Lord. Sarah, his wife, is dead. And so the people of God, which aren't really a people yet at this point, right? They've got one son, have no mother, as it were. And the promised child of God, Isaac, has no wife. So this long story that we have before us today is a lesson to the original readers and to us still today that God is going to provide everything that they need to follow God's call. And that shapes our main text. Here's the main idea today. It's a simple one. God's people must entrust themselves to God's providential care. So let's walk through this text, and we're just going to look at the different characters in, in, this, in this story and how they place trust in God and how God's providence is so clear. So first, let's note Abraham. Abraham's trust that God would provide for the promise. And remember the promise he had made to Abraham was to make of him a great nation. So this story is addressing attention in the greater narrative. And we've been tracking this, this promise here that God gave Abraham back in chapter 12. Leave your land, and I'm going to give you this land, and I'm going to make of you a great nation. And you are going to have offspring. You remember this? As numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. But at the end, 
of Abraham and Sarah's life, that promise seems to be hanging by a thread. Israel, again, has no mother. Sarah's dead, and Isaac has no wife. And by the way, he's no young buck. He's not just a child. He's 40 years old at this point in the story. And so this story, I think, is an illustration of Abraham doing what is right, pursuing his responsibility, but doing so trusting in God to provide. In fact, I think this story is super helpful to Christians because uh, we are called to trust in the providence of God, but I, I hope we never hear that call as a call to inactivity. There are two ditches we might fall into in the Christian life. On the one hand, we might not trust God, and so we compromise the Word of God because He's not, he's not answering our prayers, and he's not doing the things in the timeline we think he should do, so we're going to make whatever it is happen. Or on the other side, we might fall off into the ditch of, well, God, this is your deal. I trust you, and we do nothing. We sit on our butt, as it were. Neither of those things are faithful, and neither of those things are what we're called to, and we don't see that here. We see Abraham knowing his responsibility, addressing his responsibility, but trusting the Lord. Now, what's his responsibility? Well, as a dad in this day, his responsibility was to find a wife for his son. And he goes about making that happen. But this time, unlike some of the other things that he had done in the past, he makes a really godly plan. Listen to what he says to his servant, verses 2 through 4. He says, "'Put your hand under my thigh that I may make you swear by the Lord.'" the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell, but will go to my country and to my kindred and take a wife for my son Isaac. So note here, Abraham, he's got, a, he's got a, an issue he's got to solve, but he doesn't take the convenient, easy route. That would, would have been easy to find a bride for his son there amongst the people in whom they live here. And that might have even been, at least in a worldly sense, strategic, right? Marriages between families, clans, kingdoms would often form alliances that made you more powerful and strong. But he doesn't take the easy route here, right? He, 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 he in fact, makes his servants swear that he won't find for his son a wife from among the Canaanites. Now, some of you are going, wow, what's the big deal, right? Well, it's because the people of Canaan were under God's curse, now, you might remember, we've been tracking through Genesis for a long time. You remember that weird story about Noah after the flood? He gets drunk, passes out naked in his tent. And his son Ham looks on his nakedness in a really disgraceful sort of way there. And Noah wakes up, and he doesn't curse Ham. Who does he curse? Anybody remember? He curses Ham's son, Canaan, who is the father of the Canaanites. Abraham tells us, or excuse me, God told Abraham, rather, in chapter 15... That his offspring were going to go into slavery, but they were going to come back into this land after, and he words it this way, the iniquity of the Amorites was complete. In other words, there's a, a time where the, the, the judgment is going to be stored up, and then it's going to fall on them, on the people of Canaan. And so Abraham's aware of this, and he's not going to compromise. Listen, he's not going to compromise the promise of God by having the promised child intermarry with people under the curse. Victor Hamilton puts it really succinctly. He says, if, if Isaac is to inherit the land, he must not marry among those destined to disinherit the land. So Abraham refuses to compromise even as he makes this plan, even though that would have been much easier. And he refuses to compromise by sending Isaac out of the land of Canaan. The servant replies, okay, uh, what if she won't come back? Should I take him there? Abraham replies, verses 6 and 7, See to it that you do not take my son back there. The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and who spoke to me and swore to me, To your offspring I will give this land. He will send his angel before you, and you shall take a wife for my son there. You see how strengthened the faith of Abraham is here. He believes that now he doesn't have to solve problems by way of compromise. In the past... He had problems in his journey, right? But he, he like compromised the word of God. He used human logic, not godly logic, right? Remember Egypt where he lied about Sarah being his wife and then once again in Gerar to King Abimelech. You remember the whole Hagar and Ishmael saga? Those were actions that were taken to solve problems, but there's, they were not faith-filled actions. They were compromising ones. They didn't trust in the 
They didn't trust in the providential hand of God. And dear church, I think there's so much for us to learn here. Abraham had grown over his long life, strong in his faith, through ups and downs. And the thing that he had learned is the lesson we keep hearing every week. And we need to keep hearing it. God is trustworthy. He's trustworthy. And Abraham believed here that God would send an angel on this mission and it would be successful. He knew the Lord would provide, right? Remember Isaac on the way up to the mountaintop says, Dad, where's the sacrifice? And and Abraham says, the Lord will provide, and indeed he did. And essentially he says to the servant here, not in the exact phrase, but he says, listen, the Lord will provide. He's learned this lesson. Church, have we? Do we believe that God will provide? We all have needs, every one of us. In fact, we, we have some needs that, that we need in order to follow and obey God. Do we trust that God will give us everything we need to obey him, to follow him, Or are we still leaning, as Nathaniel read here, on our own understanding? Trusting more in our own logic than in the Word of God. Are you, dear brother and sister, willing to compromise the Word of God? Because in your mind, well, I know this is a slight compromise of what God told me, but it makes sense. It it seems to be the only way. And this is really important, whatever it is. I can tell you, whatever it is, it's not more important than this story here. Remember, this This isn't just one story about a guy getting a wife. This is a part of a bigger story. God promised to bring a seed who was going to, an offspring who was going to save the world. And it was going to come through this family. And if Isaac didn't find a wife, there would be no further offspring. This was indeed, this was heavy. This was incredibly important. And yet Abraham, knowing how important it was, still refused to compromise the word of God. He's going to rather trust God to get it done. You see, That even in his statement, when he releases the the servant from the oath, he says, if the woman's not willing to follow you, then you're free from this oath of mine. I think that's a statement of faith. I think that's Abraham going, look, I'm taking action steps. This seems to not be a compromising plan here, but I'm not omniscient. I'm not God. I don't know that this is going to work out the way that I, I think it will. And here's the thing. If it doesn't, this is God's promise. This is God's plan. He'll do it another way. I trust that he'll get this done. He's trustworthy. You know, sometimes I think we make plans, and we come to God with our plans in prayer, but but we come asking God to rubber stamp our plans, right? It's good, and it's right, and we should take our plans to the Lord, but we should always pray, if it's your will, God, if it's your will, I trust that you will get this done, and I trust that may be different than I imagined or I think. Well, Abraham is trusting in God's providence in his commission. But secondly, note the servant. Now, how he trusted God to provide for his mission. Verse 10, the servant then took 10 of his master's camels and departed, taking all sorts of choice gifts from his master. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia, the city of Nahor. So this servant, listen to this, gets this commission from his master, and he immediately and faithfully goes. In honor of and obedience to his master. Now, I love all the images that we have in these Old Testament stories of Christ and his church. And I couldn't help here but think about the fact that we too have a master, don't we? Whose name is Jesus. And he also has given us a a commission, a great commission to go out into the world and make disciples. Uh, That just simply means to preach the gospel, preach the good news. And, And when someone converts, they put their faith in Jesus, they become a part of the church who is what? The bride of Christ. And so in a lot of ways, we're like this servant. We're going out by the commission of our master to to get a bride, as it were, right? And and we're going like this servant. We're going with all the provision of our master. He's going with the provision of his master here. We've got the presence of our Lord. Jesus says, lo, I will be with you always to the end of the age. We've got the authority of our Lord. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go. We've got the power of our Lord, the Spirit of God with us. We've got the message of good news. And so we go. And we go just like this servant with intentionality and action, but also fully trusting that God's the one that's going to get this done. That's exactly what the servant does. He goes faithfully to honor his master, and he goes trusting in the provision of the Lord. I 
I don't know if you've kind of considered, if you've read this, this passage, how difficult this mission was. He was to go over 400 miles away and find a woman from his, 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 from Abraham's family who was a young maiden and never been with a man and then convince her and her family to go to a land they don't know and marry a man she's never met. I mean, that's, that's a pretty hard task. That's, a, that's mission impossible, isn't it? And yet he goes. And you'll note some elements of his trust in the Lord. Now, one thing again we should note, is that his trust in God didn't mean a lack of preparation and a lack of intentionality. And verse 10 tells us that he brought gifts in preparation. And I don't read this and I don't understand this as him saying, let me, get a, let me show him how rich she's going to be if she'll come as sort of a bribe. I think this is a preparation for a bride price. In other words, this servant is going fully expecting that the Lord is, is going to bring success to the mission. He prepares, as it were, for, the God, for God to move. And we're to do the same, church. Uh, tonight, Alethea, we'll have our members meeting for our covenant members. And one of the many things we'll do tonight is vote on our budget. And uh, I don't think most people see budgets as very godly. And yet, they are in a lot of ways. This is us planning and preparing, trusting that God is the one who brings the harvest. We want to be ready for that. That's our investment strategy. Our budget is a tool to do that. So we're planning and trusting in the providence of God. Uh, so the servant goes in preparation, and he goes intentionally. Did you notice that? Look at verse 11. He made his camels kneel down outside the city by the well of water at the time of evening when, when women go out to draw water. So he's looking for a bride. It was probably a good move to go where there's going to be some women, right? right? I mean, he didn't have an iPhone. He didn't have ChristianMingle.com to go to, right? Um, but he, he knew that women came out at a certain time of the day to wells. And that's all I'm pointing out here. He's being intentional, but he's not trusting in his intentionality and his plans. Ultimately, he's trusting in the Lord. And you see that in what happens next. Verse 12. What does he do? He prays. He says, Oh, Lord, God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today and show steadfast love to my master Abraham. So he asks God to do this. And, and then he then he asked God to specifically show him who the girl would be. Look at verse 14. Let the young woman to whom I shall say, please let down your jar that I may drink. And who shall say drink and I'll water your camels. Let her be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. I love that. He's not saying, this is a nuance, but it's really important. He's not saying, God bless the one I pick. He's saying, God, show me the one you have appointed, right? Now, he puts this test out there, and it's sort of an interesting test. And, and we need to be careful when we read things like this in Scripture that we don't misapply them. You know, sometimes I think we like to approach God that way, and we throw out some sort of weird test to determine God's will. We lay out Gideon's fleece, as it were, uh, to kind of get some miraculous, mystical view of God's providing hand. And, and truth be told, God sometimes does work that way, thus Gideon's fleece, right? But not normally. I don't think that's the normative way we ought to approach God when we're trying to determine His will. We can get in trouble when we do that, right? Because we're looking for something we want, right? I had a guy one time tell me, he's a Christian, a proclaiming Christian who said, I, I'm dating this non-believer because she was the only person that could give me a ride one night to this game night. And in his mind, that was God's providential hand saying, date this girl and marry her, right? Uh, so we have to be careful, right, that we don't do that sort of thing. Note here, the servant, this is really important. He doesn't pick some arbitrary test. Uh, you know, he's not like, God, whatever girl slips on a banana peel and floats to the ground, right? Let her be the one, right? Not, no, that was just dumb right? This is an intentional request. He's, what's he looking for? He's not just looking for a bride. He's looking for a bride for his master's son, Isaac. And therefore, he's looking for a certain type of woman. He's looking for a woman who, I don't know, shows kindness to strangers, who has a heart of hospitality, one who's got a, a, a servant's mindset and is not afraid to work. So you see this test was really, I believe, this servant asking God to show him a woman of great character. Well, we read the story. He's praying, and 
his heart, and before he's even finished, Rebecca comes. No doubt God had moved her well before this prayer even started. And the narrator describes her as a young maiden. He says she was very pretty. By the way, that's okay, right? Uh, it shouldn't maybe necessarily be like our main criteria when we're looking for a, you know, a helpmate, but it's okay to, to marry a guy's pretty woman. I married a beautiful woman, all right? But he sees her, and he's like, all right, here we go, test number one. And he runs to her and asks for some water. And just like he asks, she gives him a drink and then waters his camels. Now, you're like, what's up with the water and the camels thing? Why, why is that a big deal? Well, that's actually a really big deal because camels drink a lot of water, right? Now, my understanding, I'm not a camel expert. I've never owned one or ridden one, okay? Uh, but my understanding is they can drink up to 25 gallons of water after they've been traveling. And how many camels did he have? Ten. He had ten camels with him, right? And a jar in those days typically would have been around three gallons, okay? And these wells were like, yeah, kind of had to walk down steps to get to them and draw the water out. So we don't have an exact number here, but we can estimate that maybe Rebecca made somewhere around 80 trips up and down the steps with water to water this man's camels. And I say that to say this wasn't just a, uh, okay, sure, have a drink here. This was an extravagant act of service. We're seeing what kind of woman she is. And so the servant here is just, I love this. It says he, he sits in silence and watches her work. Now, husbands, let me encourage you not to go home today and sit in silence and watch your wife cook lunch and clean the dishes. And when she sneers at you, go, honey, I was at church today. And the, I'm just letting the Lord reveal your character, right? Uh, that's probably a bad application of this text, all right? Uh, you'll... You'll learn not about the providence of God, but the wrath of God if you do that. So don't, don't do that. The point here in this story is this, this man is looking. He's listening. Verse 21, he wants to learn whether or not the Lord has prospered his journey or not. He's taking steps, and there are steps to discern God's will. Is God doing something? And it's clear that he is, and it becomes even clearer moving forward. Um, God is providing. Don't, just don't miss that theme in this story at every turn God provided. Isn't that beautiful and comforting, brother and sister, and reassuring to us? Finally, he's seen enough. He gives her some jewelry, a token of gratitude, a sign of God's blessing. But he's still not jumping the gun. I just love the carefulness of this servant in this story. You know, sometimes when we want something, we jump to conclusions really quickly. He's not doing that. He, he's seen that she's a woman of great character, but there's another thing that's really important in the mission. Remember, is she a part of his master's family? And so he asked her, Who is, whose daughter are you? And so she replies, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, whom she bore to Nahor, Abraham's brother. So this is the grandniece of Abraham. You know, we might look at this and go, wow, what luck, you know? As the good old boy back from where I'm from in North Carolina said one time, that's too much of a coincidence to be a coincidence, all right? Now, this is the Lord's hand at work, and that's exactly the way the servant here understands it. Look at 26, verse 26. The man bowed his head and worshiped the Lord and said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who's not forsaken his steadfast love and his faithfulness toward my master. As for me... The Lord has led me in the way to the house of my master's kinsmen. Yeah, I love this. The, the providence of God isn't just pragmatic. What does it result in in the life of the servant? Worship. Right? And this story, as we read it alongside of thousands more, showing the providence of God, reminds us of God's character. That's the, the, the kind of content of this servant's prayer. He says, you are the God who doesn't forsake. You, don't you love that? The God who doesn't forsake your word. Our God, church, never recants his promises. He is faithful, and his faithfulness endures forever. And, and that's not just a theological truth that we you know, hope to get right on a test or something. That's something that should deeply drive into our hearts and take us to a place of worship. Well, Rebecca gets excited. She runs home. Laban, her brother, comes out to see. He sees the jewelry, the camels, and all that. Uh, we're going to learn more about Laban later on in Genesis, but we get a glimpse already here. I think the text is written that Laban's a little bit of a greedy dude, all right? He likes what he sees possession-wise here. But uh, he comes and he says, servant, come in. You know, uh, park your camels out back. Got a place for them. We've set a feast before you. 
But before they eat, the servant says, let me state my business. Which, by the way, is a little break in protocol. Normally, you would eat first and then talk business, okay? And it was kind of a, you know, you understood the protocol because if they didn't agree, he probably wasn't staying for dinner. Or if he was, it was going to be awkward, all right? But he's, he doesn't care about any of that, right? He's on a mission. And all he cares about is the mission in which he's been sent. And so now for 16 verses, in great detail, the servant recounts everything that just happened. Now, this is where some of you, when I was reading it earlier, were like, why? You know, why are you like retelling? Moses, who we believe to have written the book of Genesis, could you not have just said, and the servant told everything that just happened? And we could have like, you know, saved a little time in our reading here, but... That repetitiveness is, is, is important. It's drawing out emphasis here. He's setting up the response of Rebecca's family. He, he wants, the author wants us to see the clear providence of God. And so next we see Rebecca's family, how they trusted in the clear providence of God's word. Now the servant adds a, a few details for us here like, the miracle of Isaac's birth and the blessing of God upon Abraham. All of this is, is setting up the, the story that we just read where the emphasis was on the Lord's provision. The servant is telling every detail to drive home for, to them and to us what he believes to be the clear word of God in this particular situation. And yet he doesn't push his agenda. Again, I love the pace of the servant. He's intentional. He's... He's prayerful, but he's not jumping too quickly to anything. He's humble enough to see if everybody else sees this the way he sees it, right? Uh, he's trusting that if this is God's will, then it won't hinge on whether he pushes for it right away, right? And by the way, that's, a, I think, a good word for us, even, even as we go out on mission as a church. Um, we, we should be strategic in our efforts, absolutely, we should go where lost people are, right? It would be kind of dumb to try to go evangelizing on campus on December 25th, right? That would be probably not strategic, right? We should try to address uh, the questions that non-believers around us are asking in our culture, and, and, and we should be strategic, but we don't have to be hasty, and we don't have to be manipulative, right? If God is at work in a person's life, we don't have to worry that if I don't push this and, and close the net, close the deal, close the cell, as it were, then, then we'll, they'll miss it. That's a good word for all of us. It's a good word for us believing parents in the room. We should be strategic in the way that we parent our children, the proclamation of the gospel to them. We should seek to be intentional, to live a gospel-formed example before them and put them in positions to hear and respond to the gospel. But moms, dads, we don't have to push it. We don't have to force it. We don't have to kind of emotionally twist them around. We trust, do we not? In the power and the providence of God, the providence of His saving work. The servant's doing that here. He's put this before, and he's saying, what do you guys think? Tell me. Tell me. Because if you agree, awesome. We're going to move forward. If not, I'm going to move on. Well, Rebecca's family responds, and I love their response. It says, the thing has come from the Lord. We cannot speak to you bad or good. Behold... Rebecca is before you. Take her and go and let her be the wife of your master's son as the Lord has spoken. I love that. They believed as they heard the story that God had spoken to them through this providential working. And so they trusted in the Lord's provision and they give their blessing to the servant's mission here. Now, they get a little hesitant right after this, don't they? You know, oh, the next morning, like, ah, oh, let her stay a little bit longer. Not, not just yet, right? At least 10 more days. And as a parent, I can understand that, right? You want a little more time with your loved one? It probably even would have been nice for this servant to get a little break before he started traveling back, right? And yet, he's resolute in his mission. He, he wants to honor God. His response reflects that, verse 56. Do not delay me. Since the Lord has prospered my way, send me away that I may go to my master. So the story has presented another tension for us. Are they going to send them away? Are they getting cold feet? So what do they do? Well, they say, well, okay, we'll, we'll put the ball in Rebecca's court. Let's call Rebecca in and see what, 
which, you know, we read this and we're like, shouldn't that have been like the first question, right? But uh, they call Rebecca in and we see in her another faith response. She trusted God by going in faith. They said, will you go with her? And it, this is one word in the Hebrew, three words in the English, but they're powerful words. She says, I will go. I will go. It's such a simple response, but so powerful. Do you, do you see how God is providing here? This, this bride-to-be is not only a woman of great character, full of hospitality and service. She has the same kind of faith that Abraham has. Is this not Abrahamic faith? Chapter 12, God called Abraham to do the same thing Rebecca's being called to do here. To leave her country, her kindred, and her father's house to go to a, to a place that she's never known. And Abraham said with his feet back in chapter 12, I will go. And now Rebekah, in Abrahamic fashion, if you will, says, I will go without hesitation. That church, that is what entrusting yourself to God's providential care looks like. It says, here am I, send me, I will go. Wherever you send me, I will go. Church, is this the way that we respond to our faithful God who never forsakes his promises? Is this the way our lives, the way we live our lives, even when God sometimes calls us to go do difficult things and calls us into difficult seasons of our lives? Last week, chapter 23, we learned that we were, remember this guy's strangers and aliens in this world? And we're to live like that. And this week, we're being challenged as strangers and aliens longing for an eternal homeland to step out in faith and trust that in the journey between the already of Christ's death and the, the not yet of his return, God is going to provide every step of the way. Now, that's our faith. It's trusting in the nature of God, trusting that he is, church, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides well, the story ends here with Isaac. He's out meditating in the field, and here comes Rebecca. She sees him, and she covers herself. That's sort of a symbol of preparing for marriage. And the final piece, and we won't linger here long, is we see trust in Isaac. Isaac trusted God's provision by marrying Rebecca. He, like her, didn't know her. But in that story there, it says the servant went and told him everything as well, right? Thankfully, he summarized it in one sentence there and didn't retell the whole thing. But he heard the, heard the testimony of the servant, and he too trusts that the Lord had provided Rebecca for him. And so he takes her into Sarah's tent, and he marries her, and the text makes it clear, I think we need to note this. It wasn't just a joyless duty. I love it. He says he loved her, loved Rebecca. And the story ends with Isaac being comforted after his mother's death, and this picture of her going into Sarah's tent is very powerful and symbolic. Israel has a new matriarch. Sarah's dead. Now we have Rebecca. Now, how is this story important to the big story? Well, I've already said this, but let's recap it here. God once again has shown his faithfulness to bring about his promise. Not just the one he made to Abraham. The promise he made all the way back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. We've been tracing that. Remember that? They sinned in the garden, and God is giving out the judgment, and he says to the serpent, there will be enmity between your offspring and her offspring. And then he talks about the offspring of the, the uh, enemy, being, or the uh, offspring of the woman crushing the head of the enemy. That's a promise, the proto-evangelion, the first gospel, that God is going to send one to defeat the snake, to defeat Satan, to defeat sin and death. And, and so the whole story of the Bible is tracing. Is this the offspring? No. Is this the offspring? No. But God is faithful to keep this going all the way to a little town called Bethlehem 2,000 years ago where the offspring finally was born, and his name was Jesus the Christ. And this Jesus would be the Savior of the world. He would die on a cross in our place, and he would do so to make atonement for our sins. But he wouldn't stay dead. He rose from the grave three days later, defeating the consequence of sin and death. And, and for us, the providence of God in all the Bible stories, including the one we've looked at this morning, lead right there to that point in history. 
And they show the faithfulness of God. And it's a call for us as we go, God did it. God did exactly what he said he was going to do. To believe and put our trust in him. To save us and to sustain us. And if God has done this in such a marvelous, historical sort of way, can we not then, as we look at the cross, should we not then trust the Lord in the every days of our life? That God is able, willing, and will work out His perfect plan. I pray that you will trust Him today. Some of you for salvation, maybe for the first time, if you're not a believer. And if you are a believer, my prayer for you is that you will daily entrust yourself to the providential care of God. And how do we do that? Brothers and sisters, we do that by living uncompromising, obedient, worship-filled, submitted lives, even as we rest in the grace that God so graciously gives. I don't know how God is calling you to respond to this message, but I pray you will. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this word. It has been so good to hear. And we do want to give you thanks and praise that you are Jehovah Jireh, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and you are the Lord who provides. And God, I pray you help us to remember that, God, tomorrow when we wake up and life isn't full of you know, flowers and rainbows. Maybe it's hard. Let us know, Lord. And let, remind us, God, you're faithful. You're, you're a God who does not forsake your promises. Uh, I pray if someone's here today and they're not a Christian, God, that today might be the day of salvation for them. Lord, I pray you would do this all for your glory. Amen. Amen.